Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Real Estate Investor MBA. My name is Tejas Gosai, and I've had the honor of helping hundreds of investors achieve the American dream by creating generational wealth through real estate. I've spent the past few years interviewing the most knowledgeable experts I could find in the business to cut your learning time and conquer the hardest subjects in the game. Check out rei.mba, which my team and I have packed with over 75 interviews and free access to our real estate roadmap, webinars, and publications. If you're listening, I am rooting for you, and you're already on your way to financial freedom. Cheers, and happy hunting. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to your favorite real estate podcast. It's Real Estate Investor MBA. Check out our website, rei.mba. I am your host, Tejas Gosai. I have the pleasure of being with you for a great interview with Dave Foster. One of my favorite topics in the world is 1031 Exchange. Why? Because all of my investors that learn this and utilize it are compounding, they're compounding their ability to level up towards financial freedom, towards generational wealth, which is what we're here for. So it is slightly complex, but Dave is amazing at explaining it. And before I get you into the interview, the only thing I'm going to caution you with is if you don't use this the right way with the timelines, you lose the benefit. So the biggest thing you want to do is learn as much as you can about this. And it's easy to do that. There's tons of information online and Dave makes himself available very easily. So Learn about it, do it. New investors, even before you start, do it. Veteran investors, I hope you are. And check out our website, rei.mba. We have a real estate roadmap you can sign up for on free, for free. We have a bunch of inventory, market intelligence. We're curating information nationally and regionally where I practice my commercial real estate practices in the Lehigh Valley, as well as our private equity. So cheers. Enjoy the show. rei.mba. Hey guys, welcome back to your favorite real estate podcast. I'm Tejas Gosai. We have Dave Foster with us, the 1031 genius. Is that okay to say? Oh my gosh, that's way oversell. <laughs> no, you. it's a very specific topic. It is not easily understandable. Well, I guess, you know, you teach people how to make it understandable, but just just to lay the foundation. So Some of our listeners are first-time listeners. There's other folks that are veteran listeners. And I have found a lot of definitely first-time, but veteran investors that don't know what 1031 is, which is interesting. So let me hit it off to you. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about what you want to hit today. Yeah, unfortunately, all you've done now, teaches is you set the bar up here. So you got to live up to the adjective. You have. Yes. Now, 1031 exchanges, as, as my grandpappy would have said it, is living two miles deep in a two-foot wide creek. It's a very, very specific part of the tax code that can be summed up in two pages. As a matter of fact, an entire accounting degree, the sum total of my education on this part of the statute was one half of one class period. Wow. So it's something that it's not surprising that even today, although it's been around for over 100 years, that there are still even veteran investors that do not know about it. But here's what's so powerful is that the 1031 statute allows real estate investors to sell investment real estate that is either highly appreciated or has been depreciated. That tax game where the IRS lets you play protect. You can sell that and buy new investment real estate. And by following the order of the statute, you get to indefinitely defer pay the tax that you normally would have. And as a matter of fact, that tax is used by you to generate more income. I'm going to stick on this for a second. Somebody explained this to me, a mentor of mine. You can correct me if I'm wrong. 1031s, it's like baseball cards. And you got your baseball cards and you keep trading them and you just don't stop trading them. You don't cash them in. And each trading card is a property, a four unit, a six unit, a 10 unit, a, a commercial property. I understand what you're saying, but simplistically, right? You're You're pretty much just rolling forward and using the government to make sure that you don't get hit. Yeah, that's exactly what that's a great analogy. I may have to borrow that one of these days. Please do. But yeah, and here's the thing. Every investor has a life cycle, right? And we all have our preferences, our goals. We all have different desires and types of real estate that we like. The 1031 exchange allows you to go through your entire life and do exactly that. Swap baseball cards. 
Are you tired of the Yankees? Start collecting the Royals. Are you tired of first baseman? Start collecting outfielders. Any type of real estate, any time, has any place, as long as it's used for investment. I think what the real impact of that is, it's nothing more than an exercise in compounding interest. Except you're taking the tax that you normally would have paid and you're generating income off of that. And then when you do the next one, you're taking that tax and generating income off of that and then generating income off the income. And it becomes this game where by the end of your life, hopefully there's a whole ton of backed up tax. Mm -hmm. Because right now, and still in the statute, when someone dies with real estate assets, those assets go to their heirs and what is called a step up in basis. In other words, all of that tax that you deferred and that you made money on for years goes to your heirs tax free. Which is crazy. You, you, you just said some magical words here, right? And just full disclosure, I went to law school. I love the term statute and you keep saying it for, for folks that need to know this was written into law because the government loves people that do this, right? Absolutely. It's been in effect since 1920. And yeah, it's that long, right? Here's where it started. And this is what's so cool about it now. Yeah. Is that it started as a way to allow our nation's small farmers. We were just moving in the 20s, right? Yeah. From the agricultural to the industrial age in America. And it was designed to allow small farmers to buy bigger holdings. The problem up until then was that if a farmer sold a farm to go buy a bigger one, by the time they paid the tax, they would not have the money to go buy the bigger farm. Hmm. And in an attempt to, in, to really increase the agriculture, the industrial agricultural base of our country, they instituted Section 1031. And it went on for decades, primarily used by farmers and large industrial property owners. Hmm. But in 1995, something magical happened. A lawsuit was settled, which you're well aware of. Yep. Starker versus the commissioner. Yes. Starker was a guy who sold a piece of property, parked his money with the buyer of his property for over 18 months, and went on a shopping spree. And every time he found a property he liked, he had them buy it for him. <laughs> and he said, well, I did it to 31 Exchange. The I, this is in about 1980, I think. The IRS begged to differ. They fought it out. Until mm -hmm. finally, Starker won. Yeah. And now Section 1031 can be available at the organic individual investor level. Which is the greatest gift that this gentleman could have ever given oh, us. Yeah. You're talking, it's cool to talk about, I mean, I never knew that, the farmer farming aspect. And it makes total sense, though. Somebody should teach that, right? <laughs> That's a cool reasoning. But yeah, now that... The common man has been taking advantage of it. it. It does the same thing. It really takes them from this level all the way up here. And you were mentioning different types of investors. Are they're on a different like timeline of what they're doing. I'm a firm believer. Like you got to know that in your first or five or six multifamilies, you, or, or one multifamily before you even start, you should know what you're doing so that you end up on this path the right way. Because there's people that have bought and sold tons of real estate, never did this once. Do you run into people like that? Oh, all kinds of. I mean. In all sorts of walks of life, real estate at its most organic level is all about growth into it, which is exactly what you're talking about. You don't, you don't wake up one day. Well, as one of our former presidents said, with a small million dollar loan from my dad, I built a billion dollar real estate empire. That's not how most people work. And that's not how most people should work. Otherwise, you get into the area of ready fire aim, and that's a recipe for disaster. So really, it's, it's kind of fun for me to work with all kinds of people who are what I call accidental investors. They inherited a piece of property from their grandparents. They each had a piece of property, they each had a house, and then they got married, so they moved into one of them. By the way, do you know which house they've always moved into? Their parents. The wives. The wives. The only one that's clean. <laughs> that's good. So they become landlords accidentally, right? Yeah. And after a year or two of drinking that Kool-Aid of the rental income. Hey, this is kind of nice. Let's sell this. And man, we've got so much equity. What are we going to do? Let's go buy two. Mm -hmm. And that's what the 1031 exchange is for. Then let's buy four. And then all of a sudden they start to look and they see greater pastures. 
which is where you live, more in the commercial and larger multifamily this thing. Be kind of fun to take my toes here. Yeah. Why don't we buy a duplex? Why don't we buy a fourplex? Why don't we start small? Why don't we joint venture with some? And in every one of those cases, they're using the 1031 exchange so that they're getting, so that as their deals get bigger, the amount of money and capital that they have to put into them gets bigger. And that's how their capital grows with their experience. And it's such a joy to watch these people. Yeah. Because they get it. And then they're hungry for knowledge. Mm. And then they become research bunnies. And that would, it's game over. Yeah. Because they're looking all over the country to try and find holes in the market, to try and find funnels of government money, to try and find places where there's inequities in performance. Mm. And the 1031 exchange allows you to move anywhere into any time. So it's perfect for growth. I love what you're saying. So let's talk about it exactly. I'm uh, some somebody who inherited, which is the step up basis. It's just like the greatest gift anybody who sadly passes away can give you. So it's cool. You know, you probably have some really tough working folks that come into this money when they do it. Right. How do they do it? They're like, oh, we're going to sell this property. What's the timeline? Let's let's go through that. Yeah, a little bit about the mechanics of it, because like with everything, the IRS, because they lost a court case, has to let us do it. They don't have to make it easy. Yep. And so it's all about convenience on their end for monitoring and compliance. So you want to think of the 1031 exchange always starting with the sale of a piece of property. Now that's counterintuitive because in real estate, everybody says what? You make your money when you buy. And that's true. But the 1031, you keep your money when you sell and use the 1031. So that's all about closing the back door. And that's going to start with your sale. So if you sell a piece of property, now the single most important thing to understand is that this is not a do-it-yourself process. I get calls every month, even after 25 years in the business, I get calls every month from people who say, hey, I closed on a piece of property last week. I want to do a 1031. Yeah. And all I can do is just weep with them. Yeah. Because the opportunity is over. The qualified intermediary, the books like me, are going to be their guide through the presses are required by the IRS, and we have to be involved prior to the closing of the sale. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Now, once the sale happens, you're held hostage to a couple of timeframes. You've got 45 days, and that's calendar days, to identify your potential replacements. After day 45 is over, you can't change the list. So day 45 is it. Let me say, so if I own a, a three unit, and I sell it. So from that date, I have until midnight, 45 days to find another three unit or, or, or four or five, three units and identify them. Correct. Or a piece of land or a commercial building or type doesn't matter, but you've only got that 45 days. Now, this is why I tell people particularly when we're in a market season like we are, where it's still very, very active and it still could be called a seller's market, that you use that 45 days, not just to identify, get under contract. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the only statutory order is that you must close your sale before closing your purchase. So many of my investors, particularly those that are transitioning into larger commercial properties, will get a letter of intent or contract on that property first. And the reason it's very simple, it's because the contract periods usually are vastly different between residential and commercial or residential and large multifamily. So the due diligence period, the finance period, all of those things are typically strung out more in the larger commercial properties. So it's possible for you to get under contract before you even list your residential property because that's kind of a 30 or 45 day close. Your commercial property could have 90 days. Yeah. But by having both contracts in place, you mitigated a whole ton of risk. I love what you're saying. I'm a commercial real estate agent with a very great team. And we have clients that know what they're doing. They're like, I'm under contract. I need to go hunt down properties. Though, you know, sadly to say this, but some people will put a few properties under contract and hey, if they, they got to break a couple of them and move on theirs, that's kind of the negative part of this from a, come from a commercial real estate standpoint, from a selfish standpoint, for my clients, I love it because it's a win. But yeah, the timeline and the difficulty is... The, not the difficulty, sorry. You handle the simplicity or I guess, you know, you make it simple. It is really hard on the inventory side from some folks because there, there isn't, you know, there's just not something there. But they do land, it closes, or when, when does it have to close? How, how about that? 180 days. So again, from the day of the close of the sale, you've got 180 days to complete your purchase. So generally, that's not such a big deal. Okay. It's that 45 
Because once you're past day 45, if you lose those contracts, you're SOL. Mm -hmm. And then you have to pay the capital gains. And Correct. So back to that timeline, I'm smart. I, I talk to Dave. I get ahead of it. I talk to Tejas. I get a property. I'm selling a property. I'm buying a property. It's about to close. It's 44 days and it gets pushed to next week. SOL, right? If well, no, if you're under contract and you go past 45 days, you're fine. Okay. As long as you close within 180. Okay. So then you're at the 179 day period, the closing is delayed, you're SOL. You're SOL. That's exactly right. How about this? If you are identifying properties and you identify, is there a max number? There's a couple little nuances on this that are really counterintuitive. What the IRS is trying to do, we got to understand their, their thinking. What they're trying to do is manage information and keep the nefarious taxpayer because it feels like, doesn't it, from in their mind, we're all cheers. They're just trying to catch us. It's kind of what it feels like. <laughs> so they're trying to manage the amount of information. Right. If you name three or fewer properties, so in other words, you're keeping your information out there minimal, then it doesn't matter how much they're worth. So you could sell a property for $300,000 and you could identify three $5 million properties. Probably not. Now, the key is, of course, you're going to have to close on one or more of those. If now, So those are great if you're going from smaller to big. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to go from bigger to smaller, like you want to sell for 300000 and you want to go buy four or $500,000, you can identify more than three, but their total value then either cannot be more than 200% of what you sold or 600000 or you actually purchase 95% of the properties on the list. And it's, honestly, this is, this is the part where I always get asked why. Mm. Why is that? I don't have a clue. Mm. It's just what they came up with. Just accept it. Yeah, just accept it. Now roll with it is what it is. Okay, I love this. So just a caution too for some people, I've had this problem. You're under contract on a property or two and then, you know, the seller decides not to sell it. <laughs> there's, there's so many like things that could kind of go wrong. But it can go really, really right. And then you close on the property. What happens in that? Like, what happens after that? So after that, there's only one more thing that happens. And that is that your accountant files a form 8824. It's just like a Schedule A, Schedule E, Schedule C on your next tax return. And by the way, if this would be a good point to say what I mean when I say your, I mean whatever tax paying entity is doing the exchange. Because it does not have to be an individual. Any entity that pays taxes, LLC, corporation, as corp, partnership, tenant income, can do a 1031 exchange. But your accountant files a form 884 for that tax return for that year. And what that does is it reconciles and brings the basis of the old property forward. It readjusts any additional depreciable basis. So it puts that into play. And then you start over all over again. And you're done till you're ready to sell again. And percentages what how much are like capital gains what's the worst on capital gains or oh, our lovely neighbor to the west california if you sell a property and do not do a 1031 exchange you're going to pay probably 20 percent federal because they're an iron bracket there's two brackets 50 zero 50 percent and you jump to 20 percent if your income is four hundred eighty thousand, i think a year or more so in, in california you're going to pay 20% federal, 10% state, another 3.8 to the Affordable Care Act, another 1.8 to the Taxing Authority in California. You're going to pay almost 40%. Wow. And so, and you know, down to down here in Florida, where don't tell anybody, but we don't have a state tax. Mm -hmm. So we get completely away from that. So is there motivation? Absolutely. Right. If you've got a two or three hundred thousand dollars, you're easily looking at 60. $220,000 in tax. Just gone. That's Poof. a joke. Exactly. And so I right now here's the encouragement on this because this is a tough time, like you said, to find inventory. It's a seller's market. I can sell my property, but it's hard finding something to buy. There's a what I call a poison pill of 1031 investing that you just have to accept and swallow it because the absolute best time to start a 1031 exchange and sell your property is what? Seller's market. Yeah. What's the absolute worst time? To find a good bargain, sorry, market. But no matter where you're at, the opposite is true as well. If you're in a buyer's market, you're going to have a horrible time <laughs> selling your property. But if you can, it's the absolute best time to go find your replacements. 
And some fortunate investors, and depending on when you put this podcast out, some of your fortunate investors will find that they're right now in what I would call them in a ski term, shoulder season, right in between, where we're kind of transitioning our from a seller's market to what may be a softening buyer's market. Well, how beautiful if you can sell it at the peak and go buy after returns. And that's what 45 days and the 180 total to close can really benefit you. But you just have to accept what the market is giving you. Yeah. And understand that when it's sell at the top, it's probably unreasonable for me to think that I'm going to buy at the bottom. Mm-hmm. I may have to compromise and go find some other reasons why this new property is better. Yeah. You know what? I'll add to that. Some people who don't know about this, and even the folks that do, but cap rates are negligible and cash flow is, is it's, you know, you, you don't factor some really big benefits in. I'm sure it's not easy to early stages figure out, hey, I'm going to 1031 for a couple of years. This is how much it's going to help me. But at the baseline, you're saying I could save 40% and use that towards another property, which is why this is so good. And that's why when you're selling and purchasing properties, there's other factors to take in like this. Yeah, that's exactly right. I tend to tell people to don't look at purchase prices to be all in, because if you're going to sell high, you may have to buy high. Instead, look at the why. Why am I picking to sell this? Is it because I want to go into a different sector from a single family to older family? Well, that's a good reason. Is it because I've got looming CapEx expense? Maybe a new roof or something that I'd rather not own it. I've got what you're saying. Keep going. Yeah. It's great. So I sell it and I go buy something that's a newer build with less CapEx exposure. Maybe I'm, it's amazing how the market in America acts like a ripple. Yes, it's a smaller market, but it's still, stuff does not happen at the same time. And when California tops out with its appreciation, which you wouldn't want to own there, even if you're not making any money right. for the appreciation. But when that tops out and stagnates, wouldn't it be nice to go to Kansas City where cash flow is key? So are you wanting to move from appreciation to cash flow? Are you wanting to prepare for retirement? This is honestly a, a really nice, powerful application of a 1031 because you can go from active to passive management. And right where your people live, especially Tejas, is, is right there in the passive, preparing to let the next gen take over. Yep. Yep. And generational wealth. That's what you're doing too. It's all generational wealth. A lot. I mean, when you're an early investor, like that's what the dream part is. And then, I mean, it's great that you, I mean, let me say it in the right way. Dave, you are changing lives. It's a fact. And when you think about real estate, I hate it that people don't think about this. We're putting roofs over people's heads and we are providing services that are necessary. It's a good thing. Hard question. I was told previously that it could only be a multifamily for a multifamily, a gas station for a gas station. It was the like kind term. What is that? What, how, how does that thing work? Yeah, unfortunately, it's, well, fortunately, it's much, much broader than that. The exact wording of the statute is that it is any property that is used for productive use in business, investment, or trade. As long as it is investment real estate, it qualifies for any other type of investment real estate. And that's what makes 1031 so powerful. Do you mind if I can just go personal for a minute? Please. I'll tell you what our story was. Please. We started in Denver, Colorado. I sold a duplex right after I bought and fixed it up. And I was all fat and sassy because we had a 10-year goal of going sailing forever. Wow. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Until I met with Turbo Andy, my accountant, at the end of the year, and he said, man, do you all like tax? And what do you mean? And that's when I learned about the 1031 exchange. So we immediately started to build our portfolio in Denver. And in Denver, it was all single family rentals. And we decided we were going to move to water because that was our goal, right? Mm-hmm. So to go to Stanford, Connecticut. Ahead of that, we started to sell different properties and buy in Connecticut. And we were still buying single families. And another key that a lot of people don't know about is that another part of our strategy was that we would sell our primary residence. And every time we did that after living there for two years, we got $500,000 of profit tax-free. Where we moved, when we moved to Connecticut, was into one of our former rentals. Wow. And up until 2008, the statute still lets you take the full 500000 today. So while we were in Connecticut, we moved into a former rental, converted it, two years later, sold it, the entire 500000 gained tax-free. That went into the buy-the-book kitty. So we had two things going in. 
we were building up the income production and we were pulling out tax-free dollars to buy the boat. And then we realized, oh, crud, we had asked God to let us move the water to Salem. We forgot to ask for warm water. <laughs> so we started to transition everything to Florida. Florida. And did the exact same thing. Generated enough tax-free money to buy the boat and then used the 1031 exchange to move into a series of commercial, small multifamily, vacation rental, and raw land investment. And 10 years to the date of setting our 10-year goal, we sailed away on a boat bought with tax-free dollars, oh. generated income from a portfolio of tax-deferred dollars that let us go raise our four boys on a sailboat for 10 years. I am oh, an incredibly fortunate man. Oh, man. Thank God. Thank God. Dave, you're, you're brilliant. And I got to give you my plug. So all investors, 1031 is a beautiful, beautiful thing. People like to talk about it. Most of the people we have on our show don't mind if you communicate with them. So Dave, how do they get in touch with the 1031 genius? We, that would be, that's probably my wife, actually. But we, <laughs> we have tried to make it as easy as we can for people because we like to give back. I see what it's done for me. And I mean, it's fun to be a part of the journey of those people that are just starting out, those people that are just finishing up and realize that, wait, even at this late date, I can use this to my advantage. Yeah. So we've tried to make it as easy as we can. The1031investor.com lets you contact us. We've got a YouTube channel, all kinds of videos, calculators, blogs, articles, and you can it's find beautiful. us there. Yeah, it's awesome. It's in the show notes. Please check it out. Dave, we're running over time. I got to let you go, but I love you, man. Thank you. This was awesome. It's always fun to talk to a great attorney. <laughs> By the way, you know what the definition is? I saw it on a t-shirt in Key West. A good attorney knows the law. A great attorney knows the judge. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I'll tell you one last thing. I don't practice. I don't want to. I went to law school. Never, never did it one day in my life. I got a taste of real estate. Just like you said earlier, the Kool-Aid, done. I said, See, you're an attorney that doesn't do law work. I'm an account that doesn't do taxes. <laughs> we both love real estate. Oh, definitely. Well, listen, you're the best. I'm going to join you on your boat one day. Let me bother you. <laughs> All right, guys. It's Real Estate Investor MBA. That's Dave. Cheers. Cheers. 